and I came to this work about two years ago, and my, well, my initial kind of um, rationale for doing some methodological work was that I didn't see any methodolog methodology within the work in terms of explicit work that was going on, but obviously there was um, assumptions being made implicitly, i.e. that the, the world was structured and it was dynamic and so on and so forth. So I wanted to try and underpin this fact of work with a methodological position. So the, the presentation today is called The Advantages of a Critical Realist SSA Theory. And so before I jump into the advantages, I, I suppose I should really outline specifically what I think of critical realism. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm going to do on that is, it's a very difficult project to pin down, I think, because it's continually moving forward and Bashkirk never makes up his mind exactly what he's doing. I'd like to say, say that. So it began as a philosophy of science and now I would say it's a totalizing vision of a human emancipation almost. He has this view that it's, you know, we're all linked together in some spiritual way. So as a philosophy of science then, just to start off then, it involves ontological inquiry and the generation of second order knowledge. So that's useful to have for substantive theory, which is generating first order knowledge. There's something behind it which is there to kind of under labour in the Lockean sense of clearing up any inc uh, you know, inconsistencies or confusions. And he begins by critiquing positivism. And so what he says is there's a theory practice inconsistency within positivism, which stems from the fact that if you actually follow positivist methodological prescriptions, you can't generate any knowledge. Because positivism is based on the fact of constant conjunctions, scientists basically outside naturally just recording uh, events which occur naturally in constant conjunctions. And what he points out is that because the social world has intentionality and that means that there's choices to be made, the social world rarely ever has constant conjunctions and therefore what scientists are actually doing is closing a, an open environment artificially. And so what they're doing in their, in their practice is completely different than the theory. And so there's an inconsistency there which, can, which leads to an anomaly. And so what I'm saying is, the, the philosophy of science I don't think was ever meant to be an academic philosophy of science which stood alone, because I think it always fed into what I would call a philosophy for science. So what he's doing with a philosophy for science is what I've said here is, whereas one of the tasks of the philosophy of science is to highlight inconsistencies, the philosophy for science presupposes the falsity of some of these practices and asks the transcendental question, why is the likes of positivism or the idealism so dominant? In an, in an arena where they're so obviously false. And what he does then is he, he brings in a kind of a Marxist analysis in the, in the sense that he, he looks at theoretical productions in the light of the institutions which they justify or rationalize. So again, to look at positivism, the example that Bashir says is because it um, neglects underlying structures and, and um, denies the reality of underlying structures, it reifies facts, it's monistic in terms of you know, everything seems to be as it is, it actually justifies the status quo. So that's how we would go about that. So how does this philosophy for science then entail any emancipation? Well, what Bashkar says quite simply is that if you're an exploited or um, a repressed class, you have an interest in understanding the nature of your oppression. So it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient, obviously. Just to know you're a slave doesn't mean you're not going to be a slave tomorrow, for example. Um, Collier puts it even better. He says that because there's an interrelationship between theoretical production and the real world, if you undermine the, the, the false ideologies, you start to undermine the, the, the institutions themselves because oppressive institutions by their nature will only ever survive if they're stabilized by you know, people's false beliefs of them. So the reason I'm going into this part of the start is because what I really feel is that critical realism has a lot of similarities to Marxism in the sense that it has a, a view of um, theoretical production, so Marx would have looked at the vulgar economy. It has a view of the real world institutions which help to generate this and sustain it, which is capitalist production relations in Marx and generally institutions in Bashka. And there's an, an emphasis on the relationality, so the ideology in Marx or the, the, the relationship we've just discussed for Bashka. Okay, and what I'm really arguing is that critical realism is predominantly an emancipatory project. So, in that sense, then, if Bashkir is really concerned with um, structural change, and as a socialist I think he is, I mean people can argue this at the end whether he is or not, but the agency structure relationship seems to be central. So what is the re relationship? It's called the transformational model of social activity. And basically what he says is, in a nutshell, agency and structure are 
mutually interdependent without ever being completely reducible to each other. So the example I use when I ever give this presentation is the English language. So if we start by talking about the relative autonomy of structures, English language is relatively autonomous of me because, number one, it pre-exists me. In other words, the English language is there before I ever learned it. Speak English, that's the first thing I think about. Um, so therefore, it has autonomy in the sense that it pre-exists me. It also enables me to communicate because there's a pre-conceived idea of signifying certain things. This is a chair, for example. There's a preset grammar and stuff like that. So it enables me and it also constrains me. So it has real world effects. So I'm acting within structures. If all of human life ceased tomorrow, obviously our social situations, if enough people believe the second mode, they might try to reorient their action towards changing the structures to keep them oppressed. So in this sense, then, the baseline argument of agency and structure is, is optimistic from Bashkar because he says that structures are in some sense dependent on human agency and they have to be reproduced by human agency. And if they have to be reproduced, then they can be transformed. However, there is a couple of difficulties in, in transforming social structures, obviously. Um, one is that Bashkar points out that most of our action tends to be, or sorry, most of our structural reproduction tends to be as a consequence of unintentional action. So again, I'm using um, I'm using today to try and argue for critical realism within SSA theory, and unintentionally I'm reproducing the English language. Our wage labourer gets up in the morning and intends to reproduce himself or give himself a subsistence wage, or not a subsistence wage, but to, to subsist for the next week, and unintentionally he reproduces capitalism. The second thing is that an awful lot of our action is tacit, you know, we, we tacitly act. So we're not always intentionally acting, that's another problem. And the third thing is there's an irreducibility which means in critical religious terms, there's a level of emergence in social structures which act back on people. And one of the ways that they act back is by generating false beliefs and so on and so forth. So we tend to believe that there's a fair exchange in the marketplace, free exchange of labour. We tend to believe a, free day, a fair day's work for a fair day's play. So these are things that mitigate against having structural change. Okay, so what does this mean then in terms of a, a social ontology for, for moving more towards SSA theory? Well, if you believe that our social structures are in some sense agency dependent, in the, you know, in, as I've just explained, well then it means that we have an environment which is structured, I've explained that, dynamic because we need to reproduce them continuously, so it's a dynamic uh, social ontology. Open in the sense that we have intentionality which presupposes choice, and choice presupposes we could do differently so that they're reasonably open. Historically contingent because if they're open, well then they must be historically contingent. There's relationality going on because um, you know, agents act, but they don't act uniformly. The, the, the President of America acts completely differently than I act because of his enablement and constraints are different than mine. And the last thing is the emergence, which I've explained, which is the irreducibility. So in terms of what this uh, entails for, for SSA theory, well, initially what I think it does is it affirms SSA theory. Because if you look at what it does for Marxism in general, it entails the rejection of teleology, for example, straight away. Because if there's no determinism and there's no necessity within these open structures, then you can't have any necessity for us, uh, socialism. It also entails that the base, the, the crude base superstructure model be readjusted to be more, okay, the economic level, it exerts influence and has, you know, there is structural um, constraints there and limits outcomes, but there's no overall, <coughs> political action can be causally efficacious. Um, and so I think SSA theory has already taken these ideas on board. So for example, it's obviously structured, it's in the title, so it talks about structures. Um, dynamic, well it's a capitalist, <laughs> it's a theory of capitalist accumulation, so by definition it's dynamic. Um, open in the sense that at a middle range level of theory, it never tries to generalize the ideas, it looks at specific countries and specific times. So it is historically contingent and open. And then what um, Professor Wilson and Lippert were talking about today is that there's an internal coherence within the SSA. So it's not just a laundry list of ideas, it's, it's already relational and there's an emergence within the structures. And I forgot to just give you a slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's as far as we've gone. But there's just a couple of things that I think if we have a more explicit engagement of critical realism, it can help SSA theory. So the first one would be then, 
to go towards a philosophy of science, clearing up any inconsistencies. And what I'm saying here is that societal openness means that it, SSA theory must be a theory of qualitative and institutional analysis and move away from any long wave theories or macro econometric modeling because the second one, econometric modeling, is based on closed, constant conjunctions of events which rarely occur. And the first one is because the long waves, I believe, that even if there has been specific long waves, they're, they're more of a historical anomaly because if there's real agency and real class struggle going on, there's no reason for them to be 25 year SSA. It has to be a stage theory which is historically contingent, I believe. Um, the second set of advantages I think are even more important though, and they're to do with um, SSA theory as a, as a more of a normative or a, an emancipatory project. And what I'm saying here is that because it's just a theory, okay, my view of SSA theory is that it begins as a Marxist or a neo Marxian account of capitalist accumulation. It affirms the fact that there's crisis, there's class conflict, there's contradictions within capitalism. But because then the theory moves into how capitalism stabilizes itself in spite of these differences, it becomes, it's easy to forget that there are these contradictions. You know, capitalism is very inherently unstable, but it seems to be able to stabilize itself. So what we end up nearly doing is naturalizing capitalist production relations as they move through relatively stable SSAs. Now, if, as critical reason says, social structures are always points of change, then there's no necessity that there's going to be another SSA um, that'll be, you know, that'll develop and will be amenable to capital accumulation. What I would say is the SSA, rather than being, that has, I think has very functional overtones, as if there's a capitalist class who can continually come up with the goods each time there's a crisis, we can create a new SSA to get ourselves through 25 years and then we'll have another one. Clearly that's not the case. There's, you know, if, there's, if, if it's an area where social structures are about agency, well then the working class can have agency too. And it's an area of contestation. And by remembering that, that's one way that SSA theory can guard itself against naturalizing or having functional overtones. Um, two last points. One thing is that when you add critical realism and SSA theory, you get a good complementary kind of analysis as well. Because if critical realism is based on uh, points of change, social structures that are at points of change, and as Professor Cox's article in the 94 book says, these moments of structural change are most likely to occur during crisis, well then you get a, a theory which has a complementary kind of analysis that, you know, change is possible, but it's usually most amenable at a crisis period. So what you would say to a working class um, hegemonic project is, Go for it when there's crisis, basically. Okay. And the last thing then that I'm going to say is that um, this all entails following Bashkar, who follows Marx, I think, and in dismantling the fact-value distinction. So what Bashkar says, just to paraphrase, is that if you follow Marx's critique of political economy and the oppressive structures within capitalism, well then it follows immediately that you have passed a negative evaluation of those structures and a positive evaluation of any, uh, not any, but rational action directed against changing those structures. And in that sense then, SSA theory becomes normative because we can make statements of the neoliberal SSA is worse for labor, it's worse for people, and it's more oppressive than the previous one was. And so, you know, we're not just uh, describing theory, an academic pro project of, well, it was more regulationary, it was less, it, it's, it's more regulationary, it's better, you know, it's less regulation, it's worse for people and so on. And that we, this brings us back more into the Marxist framework and gives it more of an ethical overtone. And that's why I think um, there's certain advantages in the critical realist, as I said, yeah. <coughs> so, uh,